I'm going to preach on 1 Corinthians chapter 14 to wrap up our series on the kingdom of God. The beauty of Paul's letters to the Corinthian church is we have to remember the context in which is going on. The Corinthian church is wonderful. They're, they're a loving, beautiful, gifting church. So if you have your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We're going to sit there. Um, and it's wonderful to see churches where people are hungry for the Holy Spirit, hungry for God to do something miraculous, hungry to see something unusual instead of our mundane, everyday lives. And it's wonderful when that happens. And the Corinthian church, that's exactly what they were doing. They were hungry for that. And it was God blessing them. But it was getting a little crazy. It was getting a little crazy. And so they're looking for direction. And Paul's trying to help them out. Paul's trying to teach them basically how to have church. Whenever I, I do a search or I'm looking for something that has to do with the nuts and bolts of church, I go to Corinthians, first or second Corinthians. It's a great way to look at how God expects us to have church. Now check this out, Anna. I'm going to hijack. I'm going to hijack the, uh, the presentation there. Stole it from me, Anna. <laughs> So I put this up here. Yeah, there it is. Because um, the big difference between maybe today and others, this is normally my notes. And unfortunately, God only gave me these notes, which he wrote down, by the way. If you'd like to see all of God's notes, he put them in a book, and you can have them for home use as well. So let me read out of 1 Corinthians, and we're going to take it apart. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but let me read a little portion, and then we'll talk about it a little bit and see how God does. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I'm going to uh, be speaking out of the New King James Version. And some of your Bibles might say uh, order in church or tongues in church. This one says prophecy and tongues. So beginning in, uh, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks however, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish all I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesy. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. O oh, Father, speak to your servant today. Speak to all of us today through your word. Let it sink in our heart. Help us not to quench the spirit, but to look to your direction on what our, our gathering on Sundays or other times should look like. Speak to us, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So the reason this lays so heavy on me in our finishing up the kingdom of God is these past uh, 12 weeks, I have, it's been a little bit longer, but we had 4th of July in there, Father's Day in there. We had a few interruptions. But the, I, I'm really trying to build a foundation. This is not the building. This is a foundation. What is church supposed to look like? Why did God put an Assemblies of God church in Pine Grove? Especially when up country there are I know, 47 different churches up there, and there's 70 churches to our down country, right? There's all these churches everywhere. Why put this big old building in the middle of Pine Grove? And I just, I, I pray that, and I prayed that when I first came here over six years ago. And I've had this conversation with many of you, but I just feel like, what is our distinctive? What makes us different? Why is there a need? Why is there a need? Why do we have Safeway, Save Mart? Why do we have, you know, Payless? Why do we have all these different grocery stores? Why do we have all these different places? And it can't just be because you like that and you like this and you like, it can't be all about that. But there is a need. And I don't know about you, but there are some stores you go to for meat, some place you go for fish, other places you go for get a good, good deal on bread. You know, there's, you know, now we try not to. We try to keep it on one general location. But I know if I have to pick up certain things, I go to a certain store. 
Like, I'm not going to necessarily go shoe shopping at Safeway. But I, they have shoes, right? At Walmart, it's sometimes if I just need a cheap pair of shoes. But if I'm looking for a really good, good, nice dress shoe, I'm probably going to go to a, a more uh, affluent store. So why do we have this church here? So I started looking at all the different flavors of the Baskin and Robbins churches that we have up here. And I started looking at what is our difference. What is, well, first of all, it's the people. Number one, we are different people than the people down there. Right? Different people than people up there. That's the number one thing that makes us unique is who we are. Just like Jeanette is who she is. She is unique from Tracy. That's how it works. We at Mount Zion Church are going to be unique. And therefore the body of Christ, each body is so, each person, each soul is so important because it's what makes us who we are. Because Courtney and Nathan come here makes us who we are. It's, it's part, an important part. Everybody here is super important to the body here at Mount Zion Church. So then you start getting more esoteric, and you start pulling away a little bit, and you start looking at, well, what really is a need up here? Did we need this store? Do we need another gas station? Do we need another church? Well, God determines that. Let me tell you something. If any of you have been through a building program or, or a church plant, the only way it survives is God. Church plants and church building programs, humans don't survive them. <laughs> but God does. They're tough. They're tough on everybody. And uh, I'm sure, Lionel, you've been part of construction in churches, and it's always never enough money, not people who have no clue of what they're doing. You know, I'm sure you show up to an electrical job. It must be great when they say, here, let Susie help you with that. And you're like, oh, please, no, no. She's going to get electrocuted for sure, and I don't want to have to worry. Right? You've got all that consideration when you build a church. That's why it's tough. So that's why I know God built this church. That's why God put this here. So why? Why put an Assemblies of God church up here? Robinson, Pastor Robinson asked probably the same question. He was one of the pastors in our history. He was only here a little over a year. And they, I talked to him when Debbie and I first got here. Wonderful couple. Well, I don't know if, how many remember Pastor Robinson? Oh, cool dude, huh? He's in Concord? Yeah, he came up here, though, about the first year we were here. He had heard about a church for sale, which happened to be the one over here. And um, he knocked on the door and said, is this still a church? And I said, I hope so, because I just got hired as a senior pastor. And he goes, well, my, it's, is it Bill Robinson? What? Oh, he married you guys? Is it Bill? Is that his first name? Bill. Bill and Mary? Or, or Bill married you. Which, what's his wife's name? Bill and Mary Robinson married those guys. Okay. <laughs> so it, it, was, it was just very sweet. I said, well, would you like to go down to the sanctuary? He goes, absolutely. And we walked in, and, and uh, Debbie and I knelt right here. And, uh, and, and, and Bill and his wife laid hands on us and prayed. And it was a, a beautiful experience. Actually, after that, we, uh, we grabbed some uh, Los Minos and had lunch up at our house and uh, just enjoyed. The, they're wonderful people. And, and I asked him the same question about why is this church here? And he goes, you know, that's why I felt called to this church because I believe God wanted a Pentecostal charismatic distinctive up here in Pine Grove. And that's why I felt, but at the same time, just as these Corinthians needed guidelines and needed help with it, he believed the same thing and that the Assemblies of God was a great organization to help us be a Pentecostal charismatic church. And so Robinson, Pastor Robinson felt the number one thing to do was to bring Mount Zion Church into the Assemblies of God. And that's really what he felt called to do. And after we did that, he, he moved on. And uh, I, I, I believe that same thing. That, that this foundation of this church was built on the power and the distinctive of the Holy Spirit and the move of God in the supernatural. I believe that. But I also know I don't want a crazy, wacko, weirdo church. So we have to find that balance, and we have to figure it out, whether it's going to be this crazy, wacko pastor and everybody else is normal. That's a good balance. But that's what I'm talking about. We've got to have a foundation built on it. That's why prophecy was so important to go through, because Paul speaks so highly, even in the beginning of this, especially that you may prophesy. He really wants us to love each other with every tool God has. And I believe that. 
And then he goes on, he goes, so he wants us to desire these spiritual gifts. He wants us to desire that. He says, build it up. If you don't desire it, ask God to bring a hunger to you for it. And the reason is, for he who speaks in a tongue doesn't speak to men, but to God. And no one understands him. However, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. So when we speak in our prayer language or our heavenly language or speak in tongues, whether it's the gift of tongues or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what's happening there is a language to God. And man does not understand it. But what we are talking about here is in church life, not in your private prayer time or in a small group of people who are already familiar with this, but we're talking about in church. So he's saying, look at. He who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. So like we talked about, it, verse 3 is very similar when we say prophecy is a gift to be able to love and bring love to others and also encouragement and encourage the church. Then verse 4, he says, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Well, it's just nothing wrong with that. Can I tell you this is a good thing? To encourage yourself, to edify, to go to God and just, it's between you and God. That's what that verse is really saying, that this is for you. And, and you know, you should have this. You know, I don't know if any of you have ever had a good, 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 good cry. But man, does that feel good. And I don't know why. It just does. It's not like I understand. Have you ever cried and you don't even know why you're crying? You know, I, I, sometimes that, and it feels great. And that's a similar thing. Or, 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 or you've just felt like you want to pray to God and you don't even know what. You don't know why, but you just have this hunger. You can't understand it. That's your spirit. So let your spirit cry out. Let your spirit speak. And don't worry about it. Let God, he understands it. It's not like God's going, what the heck are you talking about? You know, God knows exactly because the spirit is prompting. So then he says this about, so that's about tongues. But then the second half of verse 4, he says, but he who prophesies edifies the church. So when you have prophecy, when you feel God has given you a word, then what that is doing, when you've given a revelation of his word or a revelation from his word, those things are for the church and it encourages us and it edifies us. The church as a whole and the church individually, individual person. If God has something for us, it's not always going to be just from me. And we're going to show you that in a second. This is for each other. He says this, I wish... You all spoke with tongues. So Paul is not denouncing tongues at all. He's saying, no, go ahead. You should speak in tongues, whether it's the gift of tongues in a public setting or as a baptism of the Holy Spirit in a prayer language in your private setting. He's never saying, don't do it. He doesn't say that here. He says, I wish all of you did, but even more that you would prophesy. So let's look at this. Well, why? Why is that? So the second half of verse 5, he says, For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So what he's saying is, it's, it's not greater than tongues unless, excuse me, it's greater than tongues unless the tongues has an interpretation. Then they're the same. He's basically saying, once again, this is for the edification, for the encouragement, for the uplifting of, of the church body. So then it says this, tongue, if you look at my little subheading, it says tongues must be interpreted. Man, oh man, oh man. Do we get hung up on this? And I believe it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going against this. I believe it. But some people poo-poo the whole idea of tongues because it has to be interpreted. And if it's not, I believe it, but it has to be interpreted. Well, sometimes we talked about this last week. The interpretation doesn't always come because of someone else's shyness or uncomfortability or maybe not even aware of the gift it says this verse six but now brethren if i come to you speaking with tongues what shall i profit unless i speak to you either by revelation knowledge or prophesying or by teaching so in other words <laughs> if i call if i call john heffley on the phone and i just begin going uh <laughs> what good is that it's do, that phone call is a waste of time Right? It's, unless he's getting the interpretation on the other side, which I doubt very seriously. But we're just saying, Paul's saying, look, if I come to you, good morning this morning. Hi, my name is the Apostle Paul. I'm here to preach to you. You'd be all like, okay, I'm going to get nothing out of this service. And that's what he's saying. What benefits does it happen? If I come to you with speaking in tongues, what shall profit you? Unless I speak either by revelation or knowledge or prophesying or by teaching. So he's saying, look, there's a lot of other ways to communicate that are much better than that. Even things without life, 
whether a flute or a harp make a sound, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in sounds, how will you know what is piped or played? For the trumpet makes an uncertain sound. Who will prepare for battle? Now that's similar to like if, if John decides to play the guitar random like lead guitar players do. Right? You just kind of diddle and... And then I decide to start playing some chords. And none of it makes sense. How are you guys supposed to know what to sing? How are you know, supposed to know how to join in? That's the example he's giving. And it's the same example when he says the trumpet. Now, people in the Calvary would have known then that you blow the trumpet as certain signals mean charge, certain signals mean retreat, certain signals mean this and that. And he's saying basically if the trumpet player decides to just babble through his playing, how are they supposed to know what to do? So he says, likewise, unless you utter a tongue by words easy to understand, how will, be, how will it be known what is spoken? For you'll be speaking into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages to the world, and none of them is without significance. Big important phrase right there. Therefore, if I don't know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so... You, since you are zealous for the spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. So what he's saying in this whole section is pretty simple. It'd be like if you walked into a, a room and only people who spoke um, Polish were there and, and you decided to join in on the conversation and they continued to speak Polish, you are not going to feel part of the group or be encouraged or understand what's happening. And vice versa, if you decide to start speaking English and none of them speak English, then therefore they're sitting there going, you're doing nothing. Nothing's happening. So the reason Paul is doing this is so critical because he's not squashing the gifts. Remember we talked last week, First Thessalonians, do not quench the Spirit. Paul does not want to quench the Spirit. So he's not saying, don't do this. What he's trying to say is, this is how the church service should look like if you are zealous for receiving the gifts of God. And I don't know about you, I say it since the first day I've been here, I want everything God has for me. I want it all. I don't want just one gift, by the way. I want all of them. I want to go to God with my list of every gift. If he has the gift of healing, guess what? I want the gift of healing. If he tells me I've got the gift of tongues, I want the gift of tongues. I don't want to just settle for one little thing and then say, that's it, that's all I can do. You know, I don't want to be that person who only buys a motorcycle so he never has to help anyone move ever. Or that person who buys a pickup truck and now has to move everybody all the time. I want all of it. I want all the gifts. I want every, and I want this church to have all of it. Everything God has for us. So he says it this way in the second half of verse 12. If you look, it says, Let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. So this is a good thing, what we're doing. This helps us excel. Verse 13, he says, Therefore, remember when we see the word therefore, we need to see what it's there for. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. So many times I believed so long ago in my first beginning of my walk that if someone spoke in tongues, it had to come from someone else. And that's not what this verse says. Let him who speaks in tongue pray that he may interpret. If you feel God bringing on a prompting of a tongue, at the same time you should be praying, God, if this is you and you want me to edify the church, help me to interpret it and to speak it out to them. That's critical because sometimes, guess what? God might give you a word for you or for someone else or for the whole church. Gosh, how do we decide that? All you can do is test it. I remember I went to my pastor once. I remember this so clearly. I went to Phil, Phil Cotton, who was singing on the worship team, and I was a youth pastor at the time, and I was sitting in my seat next to my pastor. And uh, I turned to him and I said, Hey, I think I have a word. I have a word of the Lord. I was so excited, you know. Hey, pastor, I think I have a word. And he goes, well, is it for you or for the church? And they uh, what? I have a word. I have a word. He goes, was it for you or the church or is it for someone else? I said, I, he goes, well, why don't you ask God? Said, oh, okay. I didn't think of that. 
you know, my panic because I was so excited I had a word. You know. <laughs> and so, so I began to pray. And as I, I prayed, God, show me, is this for me, for someone else, or for the whole church? I opened up my eyes and I looked right at Phil Cotton. I looked right at him and I knew right away that was for Phil. And I turned, turned to a pastor and I said, it's, it's not for the whole church, it's for Phil. And he goes, but why don't you go tell Phil then? This is during worship. <laughs> oh, okay. And I just walked right over and I gave this word to, to Phil. And it was very simple. It was very orderly. It wasn't crazy, kooky, shouting. He wasn't stopping the service. And it was, that's how you have to kind of discern these things. Just ask, I know it sounds silly. How do I know if my word of the Lord, whether it's in tongues or whether it's a, a word of knowledge or God has given you some insight, how do I know it's not for me, someone else, or the church? You can ask God. And he will usually confirm it. He was using my pastor at that time to confirm it for me. When it, if, if it was out of order and not from God, or maybe the timing, pastor could have turned to me and said, why don't you talk to Phil after service? Or why don't you continue praying about that? Or during his message, he might have said, you know, Pastor Eric, why don't you come up and give that word to the church? It's a great way to test it. If you feel you have a word, one of the bummers of, of leading worship and being a senior pastor is I don't have the luxury to be able to sit here and if you guys during worship have something to come to me. So let me just offer you this. You can go to my wife. You can go to um, write a note, slip it up here, write a note, give it to my wife. I mean, whatever you do, don't let it just disappear if you really feel God has a word for you. So now he goes on in verse 14. So first of all, so verse 13, he goes, if you speak in a tongue, pray that he interpret. Verse 14, for if I pray in a tongue and my spirit prays, but my understanding is, un, but my under, okay, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. In other words, that, that might, if, if you're praying in a tongue, there's no interpretation. What good is it to anybody other than just edifying yourself? So he says, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing in the Spirit, and I also sing in, in with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving thanks, since he doesn't understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but uh, the other is not edified. What he's, what, it's very simple what he's saying here. So you're sitting in church, you feel like you have a word, maybe it's in a tongue, or maybe it's just in, in, in a word of knowledge, a prophecy. You've prayed about it, and, you've, and you say, but it, my understanding, I don't really understand it all. I don't know if that's really fruitful. What is the conclusion? Well, here's the conclusion. Paul is saying this. Look it. Pray in the Spirit sometimes. And other times, pray with your understanding. Sometimes you should sing in the Spirit, and sometimes you should sing with understanding. In other words, don't limit this thing. It's not black and white. It's not one thing or the other. It's both together. He's saying, do it all. Do it all. Don't sweat it. Give it a shot. Well, what does it mean to sing in the Spirit? I mean, I've heard people sing in, in English and in, in tongues I didn't understand. It's still one of the most beautiful sounds I've ever heard. I remember I went to a thing down in a big conference down in Modesto at Calvary Temple. Well, it's called the house now. It used to be Calvary Temple. And at one point, the worship leader just said, why don't you go ahead and worship the Lord in your spirit? And I didn't understand. I didn't hear anybody really. I didn't hear like one person stand out speaking in tongues, but I knew something was going. I know some people were praying in the spirit. Other people were praying in English and understanding it. But it was all meshed together. And it was the, all I can describe, the most beautiful sounding rain I've ever heard in my life. It was beautiful. And we'll get to why that is later on in the, in the chapter. So he's saying this. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place uninformed say amen? So in other words, if, if Wade is out here speaking in tongues and, and going crazy over here, um, how is that going to, how can we agree with him? Let's say in, in his, he doesn't understand what he's saying and there's no interpretation. We can't agree with him because we have no idea what he's talking about. Remember last week, we talked about how um, you, you, you're not always going, that the, the gift of prophecy is, is it, in within us, in today's church, is fallible. Right? Because we're 
fallible. We can make mistakes. We can misinterpret what God's telling us. We can misspeak. We can miss the context. We can miss a lot of things. So it never supersedes the Word of God. It never supersedes what the apostles said, what the apostles prophesied, what they wrote down. Our prophecy never overrides Scripture. We test it with Scripture. But at the same time, if, if Wade's out here in, in left field going bananas and there's no, and, and, he, and it perfectly could be God and you're just enjoying the presence of God and, and, and it's off the hook and it's wonderful. But if there's no interpretation, how can we agree with him? We can't say amen to gibberish. We want to agree together. Remember what it says in Matthew? Remember it tells us wherever two or more are gathered, but it also says gathered in agreement. There amongst them I will be. That word together can also mean agreement. We need to be in agreement of who we are going to. We need to be, the Bible also says, do not forsake the gathering of the like-minded. So if he's off in right field going bananas and we have no interpretation, we have no way to encourage unity. We have no way to be together in this. For you indeed give thanks well. He's talking to the church of Corinth. Verse 17, for you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not, so, is not edified. So he's saying, look at you guys are blessing God. You are giving thanks to God. Wait, you are, you're, you're off the hook in the spirit is blessing God. But it's not edifying the church. It's not breeding agreement. It's not breeding unity. So verse 18, he continues and says, I thank God that I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that I might teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. So he's just saying that's how much more important it is that we prophesy. Not just the guy on the platform, all of us. So now this weird title, it says in my Bible, I'm using the New King James, Tongues a Sign to Unbelievers. That sounds crazy to me. I don't know about you. But I always used to worry about inviting my unsaved, unchurched friends to an Assemblies of God church. I was so afraid that pastor was going to go off in tongues or somebody in there, and then I'd have to explain it to somebody, and I didn't always understand it. I don't know if you've ever been in church life long enough. It's all happened to us. We worry about it. Funny thing is, my dad came to a service one time in, uh, when I was in Antioch, and, and I was so worried about him hearing someone speaking in tongues. And guess what happened? Someone spoke in tongues, and there was an interpretation, and he loved the service. He never said a word about it. He was a Lutheran man. You know, he just raised Lutheran his whole life, didn't believe in that stuff. But at the same time, it didn't stand out. It was so funny to me. I said, do you like service? He goes, well, the pastor preached a little long. And I go, so nothing else stood out? Oh, it was beautiful. It was fine. Okay. I left it at that. Verse 20 says, Brethren, do not be children in understanding, however, in malice be babes. But in understanding be mature. What does that mean? I looked up that verse a lot this morning. Believe, I was up at 5.30 this morning, so I had a lot of time, as much, not as much time as I like, but when, when I looked at that verse, I wanted to know what that word malice meant. I wanted to know what the, God was talking about there because he wants us to not be children in understanding, but in malice be babes. That word really is saying, look at, he wants us to be naive and innocent when it comes to evil things. He really does. He doesn't want you to be so knowledgeable in the ways of evil that you're dragged down about it. We should be so separate from the world. You ever met those beautiful, pure people that raised Jason Gal, Pastor Jason, our, our former music pastor in Valley. He, uh, man, that guy, I, I, I just wanted to protect him. I just want to pull him aside. I don't want him to get caught up in any of the church junk, the church administration, church politics, any of that kind of stuff. I wanted to protect him from everything because he just had this spirit of innocence that was so beautiful. And that's what he's talking about. It's okay to be naive. It's okay to be innocent in the ways of evil. He's saying, but in understanding, be mature. In other words, don't let this stuff blind you. You still got to be know of what the, the enemy's attacks are. You still need to know. But as far as you're diving into evil, you should be very naive. You should just be like, I don't want to have anything to do with that, that evil stuff. So much so that you're innocent of it. 
So he backs it up with saying this, in the law it was written with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, says the Lord. In other words, he's even going to send people with the gift of tongues in church services where God is speaking directly through his spirit. There is going to be a translation so that we can be edified, and he's telling us right off the bat, but there are going to still be people who don't believe it and walk away. So he says, because of that, therefore... Tongues are a sign not for those who believe, but for unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for believers. Well, that makes total sense if you think about it. If you walked in, and you were an unbeliever, and you heard somebody speaking in tongues, and the translation directly affected you, or you totally received it, if it was real, the Holy Spirit says, the Bible says the Holy Spirit will testify unto itself. So you don't got to worry about whether it's real or not. God will give the discernment, especially to the unbeliever, of whether that is the Lord's. But he's saying this, but prophesying is not for unbelievers. Well, of course not. Why would they receive a word of the Lord if they don't believe that the Lord exists? That's why in this room, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, and someone comes up to you with a revelation under God that says this word of knowledge, this word of prophecy is for you. Well, an unbeliever isn't going to say, well, let's just test that out with the word of God. But that's what we're supposed to do. So that's why prophecy needs to be for us, because we test it with the authority of Scripture. An unbeliever is not going to do that. Therefore, the whole church comes together. I love this. Therefore, verse 23, Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say, You are out of your mind? And that's what was kind of happening in this church. Remember, it even happened in Acts chapter 2. Remember when the, the, the apostles were all in the upper, all those guys were out in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit fell? They all began to speak in tongues, and all of the people in the town started going, those people are drunk. They're crazy. So what Paul's trying to say is, look at this. <laughs> this happens. So let me explain to you. You can't just all start shouting out in tongues, every one of you. Are you crazy? People are going to walk in and go, and those people are out of their minds. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all. He is convinced by all. Meaning if God is speaking to all of us as a collective, he's speaking through prophecy, words of knowledge, that will testify to the unbeliever that this must be God. So see how the, the, the group dynamic can work both ways. Tongues for unbelievers, but if we're all in agreement under prophecy... It blesses everybody. Okay? And thus it says this, verse 25, the secrets of his heart are revealed, meaning God, and he's so falling down on his, excuse me, not, uh, not meaning God, secrets of his heart are revealed. So people who um, are, are worshiping God, praising God, prophesying in God's name, our secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God's truly among you. Meaning secrets of God. So what does that mean? So I'm, so I, I get a word of the Lord. I'm prophesying. And Jeanette, you've never heard of God. You don't care about God. You don't believe in God. But let's say all of a sudden, um, God gives me a word and says, you know what? Let's say we've never met. Let's say we've never met and, and, and God gives me a word for you. And let's say that word was, was I know your husband has been going through difficult times and you've had to spend time apart and stuff, but God is going to continue to move in your relationship, keep seeking him. Let's say that, okay? Which could be very true, right? But if somebody who's a stranger who didn't know you, didn't know about your situation, you'd be like, how the heck did that person know that, right? You'd be freaking out. And basically she would go, maybe God is real. Maybe God is real because how did that guy know that? Unless he's, you know, Kreskin or something. You know, okay, that's dating myself right there. I mean, the great Karnak. That's as close as I get. Like, dating myself again. Let's see, Doug Henning, um, David Copperfield. I don't know. Where do you go with that? <laughs> so he's telling us if, if you worship God and report that God is truly among you. So then it goes into this subheading, the order in the church meetings. That's what we're in right now. We are in our church meeting. How then is it, brethren, when you came together, each of you had a psalm, had a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three each in a turn and let one interpret it. But if no one there is, but if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. 
Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophet are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of all the saints. So in other words, the Corinthian church was spending its time meeting with everybody shouting out their gift. Everybody had a word. Everybody had a time. In fact, they were positioning themselves. If you do a little exploration in this, they were beginning to position themselves. It'd be like, like Jeanette going up against uh, 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 Wade, right? Jeanette would be like, uh, God gave me a word that the carpet needs to be brown. And then Wade's over here, last night, God gave me a dream. And that dream was the carpet need to be blue. And then Tracy's back here going, and Jerry translate. The carpet needs to be tan. Okay, so you know, they're, going, they're vying for spiritual position. They're going back and forth, and that's what's happening. The Corinthian church, everybody walks in with their gift. Everybody's shouting it out. Everybody's going crazy. And he's saying, look at it. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let it be two or three at the most. He's like, don't spend your whole service sitting there trying to interpret everybody's tongue and trying to figure it all out. It should be two or three at the most. And he says, but if there's no interpreter, listen, just, just, you can be quiet. <laughs> That's a nice way I think he's putting it. If there's no interpreter, just be quiet. So if the first person speaks, there's no interpretation. There's probably either it wasn't from God or the interpreter was quiet. Or, but in any ways, if we just keep on trying. Like if Richard's back there going, rah, 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 and there's no interpretation. So then Hana goes, well, maybe there'll be interpretation with me. Rah, 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 rah. And then all of a sudden, Kitten goes, no interpretation for them. God will provide the interpretation for me. Rah, 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 rah. <laughs> That's what's kind of going on. And Paul's going, no, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. Okay, he's saying, you just be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one. But then what he's saying too is if I'm talking, so I'd be the first prophet in a service, but then all of a sudden someone else gets a word of the Lord, it says that I should be silent while that word is spoken. So Ken gets a word of prophecy, and he does it in order, and I should be then, if it is from God, I should remain silent while he speaks. And then we judge it afterwards and say, Ken, you must have had a bad burrito last night. <laughs> no, no, we won't do that. But, you know, that's, that's kind of how the order works. In other words, if Ken begins to speak a word of prophecy and I get like, and this is what was going on in the church, in the Corinthian church, I'm getting insecure because I'm the pastor and he shouldn't have a better word from the Lord than I because I'm preaching today. And so what I do is, oh, thank you, Ken, 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 I know, thus saith, whatever, sit down, it'll be okay. And that's what happens with some insecure pastors, right? And he sits there and goes, because what, what, what if he had, <laughs> what if Ken had a rebuke for the pastor in the middle of church? I don't think that would happen, but let's say it happened, I could shut him down and say, that's not the Lord, <laughs> right? <laughs> and that's kind of what was happening in the church of Corinth. So let's, so he says, and he's saying, look at it, we know this is about God because God is not going to give you confusion. The person who gives you confusion is the enemy. So Paul's trying to bring order to this whole service. Now here's one of the fun parts. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask it from their own husbands at home. For it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. I guess they hadn't heard of the Me Too movement at that point. <laughs> Man, I had to tackle that this morning. You know why? Because I didn't really understand it, and I didn't know what to tell you when we came to that. You want to know something? I thought about skipping over it for a minute. I was just going to preach on that, and then now let's all jump. Then I was going to go. Now let's all jump to uh, verse thirty-nine. And I was, that's what I wanted to do. But then I did some research on this. How? Because, man, has this verse been messed up. First of all, God is so consistent, especially in the New Testament, of honoring women and breaking barriers down when it comes to women. 
whether it's women in church or, or women who are away from the church, whether it's Samaritan women, whether it's a, a, a prostitute offering gifts. I mean, my goodness, Jesus loved what we had. Deborah in the Bible as a pastor. There's so many more. They honor women. So how, what, what the heck is going on here? Women should be silent in church. How does that work? And some churches have said, well, that's, that's why. See, you should never have a woman senior pastor or a woman deacon or a woman teaching anybody, anybody else. Uh, you know, it's, it's just crazy. That's not consistent with how Jesus or the apostles were taught in how to treat women. So where does this verse come from? Let your women keep silent in churches. What's wrong with that? That's just crazy talk. Well, now we got to remember the Corinthian church, the context was, if you remember, the Corinthian church was seeking these spiritual gifts. They were looking for the Holy Spirit to move in a mighty and powerful way. And so the order was going a little kooky. And so in this open forum... What was basically happening is this, and it makes so much sense to me, because I don't know, guys, if your wife is like this, but when I'm speaking up here, my wife, I can tell sometimes, she'll give me a look. Sometimes, when, I'm, I'm so glad she's in children's church this morning, because she'll give me a look sometimes that goes, oh yeah, preach it, Pastor Hanson. I know you. Go ahead, preach that. I know you. You preach that, and you can't even pick up your socks or get rid of the dirty dishes. Really? You can't put the seat back down and you're going to preach on that? Really? Honestly, I tell her all the time, why can't you remember to put the seat back up? That's just me. Okay. So, basically what was happening in the Corinthian church would be just like that. If I suddenly say, you need to love your neighbor, and my wife would stand up and, and all of a sudden go, are you kidding? You know how terrible you were treating such and such the other day? Well, you can't be preaching that. She would say that openly in church. And that's what was happening in the church. The women were, were having problems with the men who were standing up, either saying something completely stupid and their wives were correcting them, or they didn't understand something. So it would be like if I'm preaching out of something and my wife goes, wait a minute, Eric, I don't understand that verse, and I'm your wife, you need to explain it to me. Paul's saying, you know, you can do that at home. You can do that at home. If, wives, if you have a disagreement with your husband, take it and do it at home. Don't do it in church. Don't have your little argument in church. Don't, have, you know, believe me, Debbie and I, we have fun in announcements, but I've heard them after church a couple of times, okay? And it's never really good in my favor, let me just tell you right now. Okay, and she does it, thank God she doesn't do it up here. She does it at home. And that's exactly what Paul was trying to say. When he's saying, let your women keep, let your women, I, I love the phrase, let your women, man, your women, <laughs> crazy, let your women keep silent in churches for they're not permitted. When he's saying not permitted to speak, what he's saying is they shouldn't be having this argument in church. If you have a problem, deal with it then. It's all about the context. He's, and you have to remember, this all comes with the same culture that said women should never have their heads uncovered, that they should come into church covered. You know, that's a sign of submission to authority, that covered head, that women have been covered. Now, I, I, look, at, I'm not, this is, I don't think this is a, uh, uh, a men's women versus women's statement, but to be honest with you, chivalry, I, I, I feel a sense with not just my daughters, but protecting my wife. Now, now, I'm sorry if that's an anti-feministic remark. I still feel a natural urge to constantly protect my wife. I, I, if, all the way, I don't know, about, how many of you guys know, if you're walking down a busy street and you're on a sidewalk, I feel compelled to walk on the street side. And have a, is that, is that right? Am I just the only one doing that? And my wife on the other side. And, and that's because... I still have this innate sense to protect her. Well, that's the culture we were looking at. What was happening is if a woman is arguing with her husband, a wife is arguing with his, her husband in church, is a sign of, of not recognizing the male authority as head of the household. It, is, it, it was a cultural thing. So also, the, leaving the head uncovered was a sign of, of not submitting to the authorities in the church. Just the same way as women not submitting to their husbands and husbands not loving their wives as Christ loved the church. 
So we have to understand when we look at these cultural things, women remain silent because what you're doing is you're surpassing, you're, you're undermining the authority of your husband at home in front of everybody, and it's a bad testimony. So we have to remember when we're saying that, we're not saying women can't preach, can't be in leadership, can't do things. We're not saying that. We're just saying, look at Debbie, when you disagree with Pastor Eric, deal with it at home. It's that simple. Okay. Now let me wrap this up. Uh, are you up there? Thanks. Um, first, I, now I'm going to take out the rest of this passage to through verse 40 in the Message Bible because I really like the way it wrapped it up. If any one of you thinks God has something for you to say or has inspired you to do something, pay, pay close attention to what I have written. This is the way the Master wants it. If you won't play by these rules, God can't use you. Sorry. I love the wording. And what Paul's saying here is, look at if you want to seek these gifts, if you want to seek the signs and wonders, if you want to seek prophecy, remember, he encouraged you several times in this series, do it earnestly. Seek the gift of prophecy. Seek words of knowledge. Seek the work of the Holy Spirit. Seek it. And he says, so if you're going to do that, then listen, you've got to pay close attention to the words I've just written. Because we don't want crazy church. But we don't, want a, we don't want to quench the spirit either. So we have to find the balance between crazy church and spirit-led, spirit-filled church. And we have to use what God has given us. And Paul tells us very clearly in this series, don't throw out your brain. God gave you this mind to use it. So many people over-spiritualize everything. It was one of my worries in doing this series. I know somebody will stub their toe. Oh, you have the spirit of pain on your foot. No, I don't. I stub my toe. No, the enemy has a spirit that is in your toe. And I just want to go, look, I just stubbed my toe. I don't have a spirit of nothing. Now, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But, you, you know, I don't know what to movie to go see tonight. I'll pray and fast for next week and then decide. No, just decide and go. You don't have to over-spiritualize everything. Yes, we should look to things and see, hmm, is God in this? I mean, we should be sensitive to those things, but we can't throw out our minds. Say, well, I must have made a mistake, but it must have been the Lord's will. It's not my fault. No, you made a mistake, and God took what you did and turned it into something good. Verse 39 and 40 says, three things then. I love this. This really sums it all up. When you speak forth God's truth, speak your heart out. Don't tell people how they should or shouldn't pray when they're praying in tongues and you don't understand. Be courteous and considerate in everything. And that's all we're asking. How do you speak God's truth? How do you hear God's truth? Well, you have to listen to him. You have to read his word. You have to listen to other people in your life that you respect and honor that God has brought into your life to speak life into. Maybe, And like I've said, a mentor is just someone who's one step ahead of you. That's all. God will speak to you through them. God will speak to you through the authorities that God has placed over you, like pastors or ministry leaders. So he says, look at when you speak his truth, speak your heart out. Just go for it. Go for it. Has God spoken to you something this week? You know who probably trusts me really, really with this a lot that I really appreciate is Hugh. Hugh will come to me many times and say, oh, I got to tell you about what God's doing here. I got to tell you what God's doing there. I got to tell you what God... Because he wants to bounce it off. He's not sure if it's just for him or the church. And believe me, Hugh's heart, he wants to grow in Christ. I'm just going to Let's talk about him like he's not here. He's back there. But, but, but honestly, he wants it for the church. Which is crazy because six years ago, he hadn't even stepped foot in this church. And he wants what's best for the church. And that's why I know he shares with me a lot of things because he wants to know if it's just for him or if it's for the church. You don't say it that way, but I know that's what you're thinking. <laughs> and it's wonderful and it's beautiful. And Paul tells us, speak your heart out. Do it. Just speak it out. 
And the reason why I think he says this, don't tell people how they should and shouldn't pray when they're praying in tongues and you don't understand. In other words, so if Teresa speaks out in tongues and there is no interpretation, don't go over and judge her. You don't understand. You don't know what's going on. She Don't knock her down. Don't tell her how she's supposed to do it. God is trying to prompt her and God is moving something in her or maybe somebody else has an interpretation. So number one, when you speak God's truth, speak your heart out. Number two, don't tell people how they should or shouldn't pray. And then he does this, be courteous and considerate in everything. All that we've talked about these past 12 weeks, all that we've gone through, it all breaks down to this, be courteous, be kind, be loving, use all of this foundation of God's word to love one another. Don't quench the spirit. Don't discourage someone from stretching and reaching out in ways they've never done it before. We will make mistakes. We are fallible. Don't poo-poo the whole thing. Come on, let's all stand to our feet this morning. And I believe for some of you, you really need to begin to stretch out. Maybe some of you don't want to pray that God gives you prophecy. Because what if he wants to use you? And then it's going to be embarrassing if you blow it. Well, I like what he says here in verse 38 at the end. If you won't play by these rules, God can't use you. Sorry. There it is right there. It's right there. God can't use you. Sorry. That's such a bummer. Oh, look at that. I can put it right here. (laughs) I didn't know I could do that. (laughs) I like it like that. If you won't play, God can't use you. I like that. If you can't play by these rules, God can't use you. I want to play by his rules. And I believe our church has been placed here with a purpose and a mission and a distinctive. It's my job to seek it out and to try to just put it out there so that we can all be who God has created us to be and why God has placed us here. I've been trying desperately to seek it, to be sensitive to it. And unfortunately, it's going to change every time we get new people. And new people add to the, to the fellowship. Those are new gifts and new promptings and new things going on. It changes the dynamic of the church. But our mission will always be the same. We can change the world from Pine Grove. And we do it by loving one another, loving our neighbors, and by reaching people for Jesus Christ with that love. That will never change. But how we do that is always going to change because we're all different. The more Jeanette grows, the more Hugh grows, this church is going to change. The more Brenda steps out, the church is going to change. Wade steps out, the church is going to change. All these things are going to happen. I can't do it on my own. I am not the only person with the gift of teaching or prophecy in this church. I know I'm not. God did not bring us together to the Pastor Eric show. Okay? Believe me. I'm tired of it too. I would love a worship leader. I would love more people doing this. But we need you to be available to God and to be used. Father, thank you so much for each and everyone who is here today seeking you. I pray this morning there'll be people here today that that don't walk out of here without taking a step towards you saying, God, I am available. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Show me where I am to be used at Mount Zion Church and in your kingdom. Father, as as I just pray, I pray you speak to people's hearts right now. Come on, church, be available to him right now. Say, God, I'm available. Right now, why don't you repeat that after me? Say, God, I'm available right now. For some of you, you're going to have to take a step, a step of faith. You're going to have to physically match what's going on in your heart and in your mind. So this morning, I'm going to encourage you to take a step forward. I encourage you to seek God and say, Pastor, I want to do something out of the ordinary that I normally do instead of just turning around and getting out of this church so I can eat lunch. I want to take a step towards Jesus. I want to take a step towards God. I want to do something out of the ordinary so, God, you can do something out of the ordinary in me. Let me say that again. That is a good word, church. 
I pray you take a step out of the ordinary, out of your ordinary life. Take a step out and come down to this altar because you want God to do something out of the ordinary as well in you. So right now, wherever you're at, I want you to take a step towards this altar. I want you to come to this altar this morning and ask God to do something that he's never done before. Maybe for some of you, taking a step towards this altar for this is something out of the ordinary. But you want God to do something extraordinary in you. You want to be used for Mount Zion Church, for God's glory. You want to be used here and, and, and used in your community, used in your family. Some of you need to be used by your family in ways you've never been used before with the power of the Holy Spirit. And you need to take a step down here and say, God, I am willing to take that step. God, will you use me in the extraordinary? God, will you move in me? Will you move through me? God, will you help me accept however that looks or sounds? Some of you are struggling right now where you're at because you go, I don't think I even like going to an altar call, let alone God doing something different in me. Right now, I pray against that spirit that's the enemy telling you you can't do it, that you're making it up in your mind, just like the, the, the enemy will try to do when you try to speak in tongues. He'll try to tell you that's, that's just you being crazy. Well, you can't do it. You can't. Only the Holy Spirit can. And this morning, I just pray for each and every person, not only who's still in the pews, but I pray for those that are down here this morning. I pray for Brenda, that God, you would do a miraculous work, that she is available to you, do something unusual, God, as she has stepped out to do something unusual too. Use Jerry, God, this morning. God, begin to prompt her in her giftings and fill her with your Holy Spirit. I pray the same for Andrew, who is in contact with so many people every day that need healing especially of addictions. Use Andrew in that capacity to minister to those that need you, God. Father, I pray for you. And those of you in your pews, right now you should be stretching out your hand. You should be praying with me that God would just take you and use them in an extraordinary way to bless this community, his neighbors, his family, and Mount Zion Church. And that God would use Jeanette and her entire family to lead them to Jesus, God. And that Jane and Ken, although they've been used by you, God, in so many ways. I know you're not done yet. Surprise them. Surprise them, Lord Jesus, in doing something they never thought you were going to do or put them in a position they never thought they'd be in. God, that is my prayer for each and every person here at Mount Zion Church, that you would use each and every one of us, whether we like it or not, whether we're comfortable or not, help us to be obedient to that voice. Oh, God, I pray for your Holy Spirit to fall upon each and every person, whether they step down here or not. God, love them, meet them, encourage them. Oh God, I pray this. I pray this in your name that you are going to continue to do the miraculous through Mount Zion Church, through your Holy Spirit, God, and that we would be available to be used by you. Oh God, let Mount Zion Church never quench your spirit. Let us glorify you. We ask you to empower each and every one of us with the power of your Holy Spirit and the church said, amen, 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 amen. Come on, let's encourage those in front this morning that God would use them. God can use you. Don't forget to grab an invite to the movie nights. Don't forget that we will be, are still on our summer break. We do have adult Bible study on Wednesday that will be ending up this week. God bless you. Have a great, 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 great week.